All right, good evening. On behalf of students honoring outstanding university teaching, I'd like to welcome you to the 1995 Golden Apple Award Ideal Last Lecture. Tonight, after a nomination process that began last semester, we are here to celebrate not only Tom Collier, this year's recipient of the Golden Apple Award, but also the often lost art of teaching at this university. And it is truly an art. Not all teachers, with PhDs or without, can bring insight, knowledge, humor, and care into a classroom and leave a lasting impression outside of the classroom as well. Colonel Tom Collier does just that. He teaches for the love of teaching itself. It is no wonder why so many students flock to his courses in 20th century American wars and history of the Vietnam War and leave in admiration of what they've been exposed to. Tonight, we will have the privilege of hearing Tom Collier's ideal last lecture. Um, but first, for all those who are looking at the program and saying, hey, what happened? Um, it's actually in reference to the title of the lecture tonight and not why Tom Collier is speaking here tonight, we're pretty sure. <laughs> we checked our sources and we're pretty sure about that. So, without further delay, I'd like to introduce a man whose creativity, insight, and connections have made the Golden Apple Award a reality for this university since he helped create the Shout Committee five years ago. I've worked with him for three years on this committee, and the award could truly not be possible without him. Because there's no one else who can talk about the award better than he, I'd like now to introduce Michael Brooks, Executive Director of the University of Michigan Hillel Foundation. Good evening. As one of the, uh, as a representative of one of the two main sponsors of this annual event, it's really a privilege for me not only to bring greetings but to reflect briefly on the uh, the meaning of the award. First, on behalf of Hillel and Apple Computer and the, I believe at last count, 22 uh, university divisions and departments, libraries, museums, student governments, honorary societies, and service organizations that make this event possible, uh, offer congratulations to Tom Collier. He now joins a very distinguished really an exceptional group of uh, teachers, most of whom happily are still here at the university. Some of you may know that the first year's winner, Drew Weston, uh, was denied tenure the semester he won the award, and it was his last lecture. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we hope that, I certainly hope that's not uh, going to be a, a common pattern with this, with this award. This event, I think, is not only important for the recipient, and for those of us privileged to hear the lecture each year, but truly for the whole university. The uh, university is an institution very much at the cutting edge of so many things facing our society, but in its own odd way, it's an extraordinarily conservative institution. The notion of paying teachers to read from their precious lecture notes to rooms full of students who pay dearly for the privilege of copying them down probably made more sense 800 years ago than it does today. There's nothing wrong, of course, with reading notes at a lecture. The word lecture comes from legere, it means to read. But more fundamentally, it means to choose, to select to decide what should be said and what does not need to be said. Taking notes as long as what we learn doesn't go into our ear and out of our hand through the pen without in some significant way touching our brains and our hearts. All of us, those of us who are privileged to teach at this great university, and those of us who are privileged to study here, all of us will go through the university. The question is whether the university will go this is truly a great celebration, and I am, uh, as executive director of Hillel, I'm really very proud of the fact that Hillel initiated this. <coughs> I'm sure all of you know that Hillel is the center of the Jewish community at the University of Michigan, but I'm happy to say that in addition to the many programs that serve the needs of the members of our particular tribe, Hillel has a long tradition of being involved with programs that address the entire campus community, whether it be through the pages of Consider, Talk to Us, uh, res, res Hall Rep, theater companies that Hillel you know, co-sponsors with the Housing Division. And this event is clearly one that is for all of us, but I think you should know, in spite of Gobby's words, that the inspiration for this did not come from me. Rather, it came from two of the great teachers in my community. Neither of them had an earned doctorate, which puts them, I'm sure, in very fine company. Uh, they were both known by a title which in my community is the highest accolade 
that can be given to a person. They were known as rabbi, which means, as does the word doctor, of course, teacher. They both lived 1,800 years ago, but they had students who took very careful notes and whose lives were very much informed by, by what they taught. Today, we know that it's possible at these institutions to publish and perish, uh, at, sometimes at the same time. But they, in their words, are very much alive. The first was a man by the name of Akiva, who was arrested in the second century by the Romans for teaching, which then, as now, could be a very dangerous profession. One of his students approached his prison and outside the bars called to him and said, Rabbi Akiva, are you, are you still able and prepared to teach? And he responded, more than the calf needs to suck, the cow needs to suckle. More than the calf needs to suck, the cow needs to suckle. And it is clear to all of us who have attended these lectures each year that those who are honored by receiving the Golden Apple Award are people who have to teach. My other teacher, with whom I speak every few days when I open the pages of the Talmud, was the other inspiration for this lecture. His name was Rabbi Eliezer. And he taught us 1,800 years ago Get your life in order one day before you die. And since, of course, none of us knows when that day will be, we have to do that every day. This evening is truly a celebration, not only of a great teacher, but it's a gift. It's a gift from Hillel and Apple Computer and all of the co-sponsors and certainly from the students who work tirelessly, students on the Shout Committee, to make this event possible. It's a gift to all of us. It reminds us that all of us should always be giving our last lectures. That we should always be saying the things that really have to be said to the people we care most about. And that we should be doing the things that really need to be done while there's still time. On behalf of all of us who make this event possible, thank you for sharing in this gift. And thank you for being part of this wonderful celebration. And now, uh, not quite in order of your program. It's a pleasure to call on Julie Smith and Rachel Rabkin to present the 1995 Golden Apple Award. Um, hi, I would, like, I would first like to call up uh, Professor Collier to accept the award. of uh, the Shout Committee, it is both an honor and a privilege to present you with the Golden Apple Teaching Award. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to award you this $1,000 check <laughs> and this framed poster commemorating the evening. <laughs> Thank you. And now Rachel will uh, read a letter from our Congresswoman, Lynn Rivers, um, in honor of the award. Dear Professor Collier, congratulations on being named as this year's recipient of the Golden Apple Award. I am told that this award is given to the most outstanding teacher at the University of Michigan as judged by the student body. The fact that you have been chosen as this year's award winner signifies that you have left an indelible mark on the many students whom you have taught. Throughout your 15 years at the University of Michigan, you have succeeded in allowing your students to engage in history rather than just learn about it from a textbook. Your 20 years of loyal service in the United States Army has enabled you to teach from a well-informed and deeply personal vantage point. I am sure that your students find it quite thrilling to hear about historical events from someone who has truly been there. Once again, I want to wish you my warmest congratulations and good luck with your last lecture. As with all of your teaching endeavors, I am sure that it will be a great success. 
Sincerely, Lynn Rivers. Now it's my pleasure to call up Professor Gerald Linderman to please introduce our speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening on this very happy occasion. I have several ideas about the elements that must have come together to give shape to Tom Collier's teaching. The materials with which he contends in class are very dramatic materials. Wars engage our most passionate selves, our loyalties and our loves, uh, our angers and our hatreds, and in their collisions, they impose life and death uh, sentences uh, on individuals and on societies. Primal human experience, that's what Tom Collier has called it, and he has succeeded in conveying that sense, has succeeded in making comprehensible uh, uh, not only uh, intellectually but emotionally to those in his classes. Not, however, in a teaching style that is full of emotional flourishes or uh, high-voltage preaching. He believes that societies, that peoples, are responsible for their wars. And he believes that that responsibility entails assessments that are clear-eyed, uh, that are just, that are fair. And those have become the hallmarks of his teaching. And this pattern, uh, this pattern of the, of the very dramatic setting, but the necessity always to see it clearly, to see it coolly, fits, it seems to me, not only the teaching, his teaching of war, uh, but also the, the experience of his own life. Uh, he was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, he grew up in a half a dozen places. Uh, as his father, a, a Marine Corps officer, uh, moved about the world, including Shanghai, uh, during the Sino-Japanese War of the late 1930s. He followed his father into the Marines, enlisting when he came of age in the last full year of World War II. 1948, he switched services, going off to the West Point Military Academy, uh, began a 20-year career in the United States Army. Actually, if you're inclined to be fanciful, I think that you could argue that he has at least a, a has had a distant uh, flirtation with all of the services. Uh, a Marine Corps enlisted man, uh, an Army career officer, yes, uh, but also someone passionately devoted to flying who took uh, flying lessons here in Ann Arbor to become a small plane pilot, and a sailor, a Michigan Lake sailor, <laughs> uh, who just several years ago took sailing lessons at Annapolis. His military career took him to Okinawa, to Iceland, and to Germany. Uh, but clearly the climax came in Vietnam and the pattern is a very unusual one. Three tours of duty in Vietnam. Uh, unconventional work, to be sure. Uh, work in support of the Montagnard tribesmen, working with special forces. More uh, conventional, more orthodox work uh, with his own branch, the infantry. During his last tour in Vietnam, uh, his views of the American military effort in that country changed. Uh, I did not know him during those years, but I imagine that he was then as he is now, 
holding organizations and institutions, uh, whether armed services or universities, at a distance, uh, a distance sufficient to see them clearly. So there has been a depth and a breadth of experience uh, that he has indeed succeeded in making palpable in his teaching. He seems to me never to have acquired the, the staff officer ego or the professorial ego. Uh, his humor is a delight uh, and always self-deprecatory. Uh, many people must say to him, gee, this is a terrific course. And many teachers, it seems to me, would say to themselves, uh, good, uh, it seems to be working. I can leave it as it is. But for him, it is never, never a finished piece of work. He takes very seriously every set of student course evaluations. Uh, he's not miffed by the knocks, he's mobilized by them. For they tell him what students want to learn, what they wish to know about war, and he responds, uh, unafraid of the untested, unintimidated by the new. He has degrees from the military academy, uh, from Duke and from George Washington, but he thinks of his own education as he thinks of his courses uh, as unfinished. And, and he continues to enlarge his understanding uh, exactly as he continues to build on his courses. So I think you can see why his teaching possesses such a remarkable quality of, of self-renewal. Finally, just a word about his relationship with University of Michigan students. I've embarrassed him enough. Uh, so a, a simple example perhaps will do. Six friends meet every week in a coffee shop on South University, late on Tuesday afternoons. Tom Collier does not arrive at the appointed hour. Never. Uh, uh, no one any longer asks him when he does appear uh, where he has been. Uh, all know uh, that, that a student uh, in a counseling appointment, in office hours, in a hallway, has brought a question or a problem or an interest, uh, and that the two continue to talk. It's a great privilege for me to introduce to you such a teacher, Tom Cotter. I don't see any of my enemies here, only friends. I am absolutely overwhelmed by this. I was the day I first opened the envelope in class. I can't believe that you actually gave me this award. I gave the committee time to reconsider, uh, and they insisted that this was the best they could do. Let me start by thanking so many people, and I want to say before I even start that, that I have been briefed by several people on the start time of the basketball game. So we will take that into consideration as we go. First of all, thank you, Jerry, for that introduction. That's a real burden to put on you, and I really appreciate it. Thanks also for the ride to the auditorium today. <laughs> to Michael Brooks in particular, and to all the organizations that he represented in his talk, none of which, incidentally, will have me as a member. Um, to all of those organizations, uh, I really appreciate the generosity of your support. 
to Adrian Kaplan and DC Goings, the poster, which I have tried to damage here on the stage, <laughs> um, the poster, which is about as close as it gets to making a silk purse out of a sow's ear. <laughs> to my wife, with whom I am inseparably one, and to all of the undergraduate students who make this university a delight to teach in, and also make this university the quality university that it is. The faculty, <laughs> the buildings, the staff, the teams are pretty normal. But the undergraduate student body is truly outstanding. And I say that with some experience in other undergraduate student bodies, some of which are better involved in mass babysitting than their own education. I don't find that true here. And I want to thank very much those of you who have come tonight, and those of you who have voted, and those of you who attended the class, and those of you who are kind enough not to bring the Michigan Daily Crossword Puzzle with you this evening. <laughs> I do want to talk about history because that's all I know. What I would really like to do is give a 40-minute impersonation of Bill Cosby, well beyond my scope, but I recommend him to you uh, sometime in the future as a graduation speaker. What I'd like to talk about is history and some of the questions that history involves itself with. And the key question, and I get this from my colleague here at the university, Professor John Shai, who first said it to me, the key question that history answers is just simply, what happened? What happened? Why, how, the details are frequently beyond the scope of historians and are better solved by more theoretically involved people, political scientists, sociologists, psychologists, and others. Uh, historians are having a trouble, usually plenty of trouble, just telling the story of what happened. But that's important because what happened and what people think happened are so quickly changing. And almost from the minute an event occurs, whether it's O.J. Simpson or whatever, the story starts to change. So truly what did happen is an important element in our lives both personal and national. So I'd like to look at a couple of examples from recent history, my memory isn't that long, of what actually happened and the way distortions of that or confusions of that have changed the way we made decisions based on incorrect information. First I would like to talk about is a very topical one because it is coming here at the University of Michigan on the 19th of April. And that is the question of the dropping of the atomic bomb. As many of you know, the Smithsonian Institution got into considerable trouble last fall and this, this winter and spring over the question of how to display the aircraft, the Enola Gay, that actually dropped the first atomic bomb and what, in what context to put that display. First, the Air Force Association objected to the text, and they rewrote it. In December, the American Legion objected to the numbers of casualties that were forecast for the invasion of Japan, and the Smithsonian rewrote it. They were attacked on the floor of Congress, and they finally simply abandoned the idea of any context at all. So if you go to Washington, as I'm going to do in May to visit my mother, and you go to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, which is why I really go to Washington, <laughs> you will find just a hunk of the fuselage and a very small display explaining the details of the airplane itself. But if you take the words of another friend of mine here, Professor John Marwell, Jonathan Marwell, the dispute over the Enola Gay is not about the details of how the war ended or how many people might have been killed if Japan had been invaded. The question is really, Professor Marwell says, how do we remember the war? 
How do we want to remember the war? How do we remember the war? And that idea that the Second World War is the good war and that its memory must be hallowed and revered uh, has led us to some difficult times in trying to work with this question of the dropping of the atomic bombs. We've gotten through the 50th anniversary remembering Pearl Harbor. No, not a problem. A great unifying time in American history. Remembering D-Day, a celebration of the valor and courage of the men who went ashore. Remembering all the other parts of the war. But this one, which hadn't even come yet, and won't come until August, is already causing more concern and trouble than all the other events of the Second World War put together. And one way to look at this problem is to look at the questions that are asked of history. Because history is only able to tell you what you ask it. It is kind of like a computer. It knows everything, but it's really dumb. And if you ask it a question with a <laughs> smile, the computer doesn't get it. You just have to ask the exact correct question, and history is much the same way. So on the question of the atomic bomb, if you put yourself in the position of President Truman in July of 1945, the Potsdam Declaration has just been declared, ordering the Japanese to surrender or else and the Japanese refuse to surrender. And you are asked, should we invade or drop the bomb? The answer will always be, if we game it out a thousand times in the future, the answer will always be, drop the bomb. And it's that impasse that has created the problem over the Enola Gay. The idea that anyone would not drop the bomb and would allow one American or 50 Americans or 50,000 or a million to die when they could have dropped the bomb and ended the war is simply unthinkable. So what you have to do then, if you're going to free up history and allow history to give you some more interesting and different answers, is to free up the question. If instead of August of July, August of 1945, you move it back a few months to give yourself a little slack, let's go back to the surrender of Germany in the beginning of May of 1945. Okay, Germany's out of the war. And you say to the president, Mr. President, what's the fastest and cheapest way to end the war with Japan? And the president, of course, would turn to his advisors and say, that's a good question. Get me the answer by tomorrow morning. But you see, by asking that question, you increase the range of possibilities. And you don't get into that either-or situation. Let me briefly sketch out the possibilities of the Second World War in May of 1945. There were, at the end of the war, a series of different related, but not always related, end games. As in chess, we've got the enemy in a bad place, but how do you actually end the game? You must get checkmate, or it will just go on forever. The Army and the Marine Corps, the ground forces, had an end game which they called island hopping. And by 1945, we had hopped all the way up the islands from Australia and New Guinea on the one hand, from Hawaii on the other hand, and we had met at the islands of Luzon in the Philippines, Iwo Jima in the Volcano Islands, and Okinawa in the Ryukyus. And in each one of those, the Japanese Army had showed us that they were tougher and smarter and more effective in killing our people than they had ever been. On Iwo Jima, for the first time, there were more American casualties than there were Japanese casualties. Sure, we took the island, we raised the flag, and most of the Japanese casualties were actually killed, whereas most of our casualties were only wounded. But still, the price was very high. 
On Okinawa, not only did the Japanese Army ground forces inflict a terrible price on the Marines and the soldiers who fought against them, but they deliberately, by maintaining the battle on Okinawa, held the U.S. fleet in place and then proceeded to clobber it with kamikaze attacks, which were far more effective than we had anticipated. Over 5,000 U.S. sailors died in the Battle of Okinawa, and that was new. The next iteration of the island hopping campaign was actually a switch over to the Soviet Union. And in August of 1945, the Soviets had promised, back in May, that they would invade Manchuria and move not on an island, but again into a position closer to Japan. In November of 45, the first invasion of the home islands of Japan, the southern island of Kyushu, would take place. And then we would be in a position, as General Stilwell said, of going in with the bayonet and winkling them out one by one. A grim prospect. Decisive, a war-winning endgame, but at great cost. A second endgame is the naval endgame. The U.S. Navy, on the afternoon of Pearl Harbor, started to conduct a war which, at, in 1917, we had considered illegal and barbarous. That is to say, unrestricted submarine warfare. In unrestricted submarine warfare, the submarine, without warning, sinks everything on the surface. Warships, civilian ships, ships of any flag unrestricted, a war crime, we thought. And in April of 1917, we went to war against Germany because they conducted unrestricted submarine warfare. On the afternoon of Pearl Harbor, a message comes out from SYNCPAC headquarters in Wahoo to all American submarines at sea, conduct unrestricted submarine warfare immediately. And they do it. They have a lot of technical problems, but they rapidly get their act together and start sinking the Japanese Navy, and particularly the Japanese merchant fleet, with first priority to ta oil tankers. Within a short time, the Japanese merchant fleet simply disappears. And by the spring of 1945, the time we were talking about, Japanese merchant ships are unable to bring supplies in to the home islands of Japan. The U.S., in the spring of, of 1945, the U.S. submarines have actually slipped through the Japanese island, that arc of islands up against the Manchurian Siberian coast. They've slipped through them, penetrated into the Sea of Japan between the mainland and Japan, and have now cut the absolute last link with the mainland. Japan has no energy, it has no food, it has no raw materials for its war machine. Just to make it even better, the American Air Force and the submarines together plant mines in the harbors of the cities of Japan. So even small vessels trying to slip out at night and go from port to port are sunk by mines. The blockade that the American submarines put on Japan is the blockade that the Germans attempted twice in 1918 and again in 1940, 41 against the United Kingdom. The Germans failed. The Americans succeeded. Japan is starving, impotent, without food, energy, or raw materials. That's an end game. It takes time, but it's almost bloodless. A third end game is the end game of the Army Air Forces, soon to become after the war the U.S. Air Force. And this end game is something the Japanese have dreaded since World War I. We have, in, we have meetings of, or minutes of meetings of Japanese defense staffs in the early 1920s in which they say, if bombers ever strike our cities, constructed largely of wood, we are doomed. And the U.S. Air Force, Army Air Force, looks on the island hopping campaign as simply an effort to get air bases close enough to the home islands of Japan to start bombing them. And they do it. In the summer of 1945, excuse me, in the summer of 1944, 
at the taking of Guam, Tinian, and Saipan, the Marianas Islands. An air, base, air bases are constructed, which put Japan within range of the B-29s. For a variety of different reasons, including the jet stream, which nobody had ever heard of before, the B-29 campaign is not effective until the spring of 1945. A new officer, General Curtis LeMay, comes into Guam, and he takes the guns out of the B-29s, increases the bomb load, tells them to fly low instead of high, and uses a large percentage of napalm incendiaries mixed with high explosives. And on the night of 9-10 March 1945, the bombers of 21st Bomber Command go in at low altitude, so low they can smell the smoke in their cockpits, and they destroy the city of Tokyo. 16 square miles of Tokyo are burned out. Some Tokyo citizens are boiled alive in the smaller canals, and others are baked alive in their air raid shelters. The city is simply burned out, 83,000 dead. The United States is so delighted with the results that they immediately take the next five largest cities in Japan and proceed to destroy them in the same manner. It works. When they are destroyed, the U.S. Army Air Force draws up a list of 66 more. Now, I don't know where Ann Arbor would stand on the list of 66 plus 6. That would be 72 cities in America if we would get all the way down to Ann Arbor. But we would definitely lose Cleveland. Again, it works, and in the summer of 1945, the U.S. Army Air Force is well down its list of 66 cities. Japanese industry has been bombed out of existence. There is no war production in Japan. Nine million Japanese are homeless at the beginning of this period, and more are being generated every night. A quarter of a million have been killed, and a half a million are wounded. This end game also works and it costs as the naval end game almost nothing japan is impotent the fourth end game is the atomic end game and this is held secret from the people leading the other other three that i've talked about not eisenhower not macarthur for a long time not admiral nimitz in the pacific know about the atomic bomb it's held very tightly at the top as a secret but right from the beginning, the assumption always is, we will build it and we will use it. And there are one or two minor reservations expressed. Professor Linderman himself gave me a copy of Secretary of War Stimson's reservations at one time expressed to his diary. But that's expressed to his diary, not expressed in a meeting of the executive committee that's making the decisions. As early as, as the summer, July of 1943, well before the, Japanese, the Germans are out of the war, we have already decided, that is these, this small select committee, to bomb, bomb Japan, not Germany. It appears that Germany is already nearly defeated, so we'll go ahead and bomb the Japanese. The plans simply continue, and the question discussed at the various meetings is always, which cities, how to drop it? And the answer is finally reached in the summer, actually in July of 1945, after the test at Trinity at Alamogordo takes place and is successful, to select four cities, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Kokura, and Niigata, and to bomb them as soon as possible, aim point city center, without warning on the civilian population. The first bomb is delivered to Tinian, and the special bomb group, which has been in training for almost a year, uh, loads it up, takes off, drops it perfectly. Drops at 1,800 feet, detonates at about 12,000 tons of high explosive, TNT, and kills something in the neighborhood of 76,000 people. It continues killing with its radioactivity, which we really did not understand at the time. A weather front is moving in. It looks like the next target, which is Kokura, uh, will be delayed. So by staying up all night and doing a couple of all-nighters in a row, the assembly crews put together the second bomb 
and they fly it off to Kokora ahead of the weather front on the 9th of August. When they arrive at Kokora, it's fogged over, clouded over. They are not allowed to bomb through clouds. They must be accurate. They start for their alternate target, Nagasaki. They have since discovered that they have a fuel pump leak and they are running out of gas. They've got to drop it and get home quickly. They fly over Nagasaki. It's clouded over. The pilot says, we'll, we'll bomb through the clouds on radar. The, the bombardier says, sir, we're not allowed to do that. The pilot said, we're going to bomb through the clouds on radar, and they start on their bomb run. At the last 20 seconds, the clouds suddenly pull back. They see their aiming point, and they drop the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. By the 14th of August, the Japanese cabinet has surrendered, and the war is over. So there's an end game that not only can be decisive, but is generally held in America to have been decisive. We dropped the bomb, they surrendered, ergo, the bomb caused them to surrender. The fifth end game is the one in which wars are normally ended, and that is the negotiations end game. That's the way you normally end wars. But in, in the Second World War, the United States has made a pledge of unconditional surrender. We won't discuss with the enemy, they must simply surrender unconditionally. And we do not conduct negotiations with the Japanese. Now, because we have broken their diplomatic radio code, we know all the messages that are going out to the ambassadors of the Japanese ambassadors worldwide. And the message is, for God's sakes, get a hold of the Americans so we can surrender. And these messages start out in the summer of 1944 at the time we take the air bases from which the B-29s will launch their raids, the Marianas, Guam, Tinian, and Saipan. The cabinet in Tokyo falls because they promised they would win the war. And the Japanese diet recognizes that with the Americans in the Marianas, they've lost the war. Again, instructions go out to, Amer uh, to ambassadors worldwide, try to make contact with the Americans. The Americans refuse to make any contact, dismiss all the attempts at contacting them in such places as Lisbon, Geneva, Stockholm, and Moscow. As the war goes on and it gets uh, towards, towards the end, there is another cabinet fall in April, and this time the emperor personally instructs the cabinet to start surrender negotiations with the Americans. They are unsuccessful. The Americans do not make contact. The Assistant Secretary of State, excuse me, the Under Secretary of State, Joseph C. Grew, Under Secretary Grew, suggests to President Truman in May of 1945 that because he has read all the message traffic of the Japanese, that all we need to do to get the Japanese to surrender is promise that we will neither humiliate nor kill the Emperor. So let's not humiliate or kill the Emperor. His suggestion is dismissed. President Truman is advised by his domestic advisor, Jimmy Burns, that he would never be elected. Truman has never been elected. His first election will be in 1948. You will never be elected if you start negotiations with the Japanese. So in large part on domestic party politics, the idea of negotiating is dropped. The Potsdam Declaration of July 1945 simply demands that the Japanese surrender. That's not negotiations. And when the Japanese Prime Minister refuses to comment on the Potsdam Declaration, he is hounded by the press. Yes, hounded by the press. Uh, that's not a peculiarly American institution. He is hounded by the press, and when they demand for an answer, he says to the press, we will treat the Potsdam Declaration with moksatsu. Moksatsu can be tra translated several ways. Ignore is the way it's usually translated. Treat with contempt is the way the State Department translator translates it, and that's the message that comes back to, the, to, the, uh, to Washington. So again, the decision is made, go ahead with the planning to drop the bomb, and the negotiations stop. Little joke here, history has its jokes, and of course, as you know, after the bomb is dropped, and after the Japanese surrender, we then say that we will neither kill nor humiliate the emperor. Though, in fact, the surrender is conditional. 
but we had been ins insisting right up until the end that it would not be conditional. So what? Well, so the, the impression is left at, at the time and today that we dropped the bomb and that ended the war in the Pacific. Put another way, the bomb is a war-winning weapon. And in the post-war world, what will we do with it? Many people suggest that we put it under international control. But a war-winning weapon, we'll put that under international control? Many suggest we share it with the Soviets. We're already sharing it with the British. But again, do we want to share a war-winning weapon? And so, in fact, we go to the United Nations with the Baruch proposal in 1946, which is so designed that we know the Soviets will not accept it, and they don't. And so because of this incorrect view, in my opinion, incorrect view, that the bomb is a war-winning weapon, we keep it under U.S. secrecy, and that generates, in turn, the nuclear arms race. The Soviets know what we have. We now know who told them. And they look at us, keeping this, quote, war-winning weapon secret, and their conclusion is quite simple. We'll build one. And they end up building 25,000. But we're clever. We have 25,000, too. So it is, it is true, not only in the case of the Smithsonian, but actually in the case of the nuclear arms race at that time, that it is quite possible, by misinterpreting history, to then create policy which itself will lead to problems. Now, I have prepared an entire another 20 minutes of, of lecture on a different subject, and I'm not going to give it. It is on the question of the end of the Vietnam War. And I'll just give you a quick summary of it because basketball, after all, is basketball. Here's the way Americans view, again, what happened. Here's the way Americans view the end of the war. It's October 1972. Henry Kissinger and the North Vietnamese are very close to signing a peace treaty. The North Vietnamese introduce some other terms, and in spite of Kissinger's statement, quote, peace is at hand, close quote, the peace slips away from us. And those North Vietnamese cause a lot of trouble, and Nixon said, well, I just won't stand for this. And so he temporarily cancels the, nego the go negotiations. He is elected in a landslide in November of 72. The North Vietnamese continue to obstruct the peace process. Nixon said, well, I guess we'll have to bomb them. So Christmas season of 1972 is spent with B-52s, F-111s, and the key bombers of the United States Air Force attacking Hanoi and Haiphong. Is Nixon instructs his chiefs of staff don't give me any of that crap about you can't bomb this target, you can't bomb that target. I want you to bomb them all. And they do. And in January, when we extend an invitation to North Vietnam to come back to the table, they come back to the table, and in a few weeks, the peace treaty is signed. So again, after the fact, therefore because of the fact, they caused trouble, we bombed them, they came back to the table and signed the peace treaty. Just ever so briefly, that's false. The reason the negotiations broke down in October was because South Vietnam, not North Vietnam, objected. And the bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong was not intended to bring the North Vietnamese back to the table, and in fact did not. It was intended to show South Vietnam the lengths that America would go to if the North Vietnamese tried to punish them in the future after the peace treaty was signed. Are there any consequences of this thinking, that because of the bombing, the war ended, therefore that kind of bombing is significant? Well, let me put it to you this way. The bombing campaign in Vietnam, the one that the Air Force objected to as being too slow, was called Rolling Thunder. The bombing campaign that opened on the 17th of January in 1991 against Baghdad was called Instant Thunder. 
And in fact, what happens to Baghdad is a replication of what happened to Hanoi and Haiphong. Even better, instead of concentrating the bombing in 12 days, they concentrated on the first day. And the most intense bombing we have ever seen is on that first morning in, in the dark before sunrise of that first morning of the Persian Gulf War. Tomahawk missiles have been launched from naval ships. B-52s are flying in all the way from the United States to launch their cruise missiles. Stealth fighter planes have taken off to penetrate the Baghdad air defenses. And even the Army, which has never been invited to an air war before, is asked to come and launch its helicopters and knock out some radar station. So in Baghdad, in the Persian Gulf War, in instant thunder, the first day of the war is the big day. Why? Because of the misinterpretation of what happened in Hanoi and Haiphong. Does it work? Well, the old joke is George Bush ain't in office, but Saddam Hussein is. I think you can, in fact, open history up if you play with the questions. It's not just an academic game, it's an important game for us all. If you're given an either or question, that's almost always a bad question. Try playing with the questions and ask history different questions and you might get different answers. Let me end by saying that the reason for studying history is because it's fun. I don't mean it's fun like Bill Cosby is fun. I mean it's fun like it's a very human thing to want to know what happened. We're curious animals and we want to know those things. And the story that starts once upon a time, long, long ago, is really what history is all about. The wonderful thing about history, under like, unlike biochem and cellular and molecular biology, is you can continue playing with it all your life, and all it costs is going up and sitting in those big chairs in the Walden Bookstore and Borders and reading their books for free. Uh, I, I would like now uh, to ask if you have any questions on the examples uh, that I have given you on the questions of history. Do any of you have any questions? The question is, what do I personally think of the situation of the Enola Gay in the Smithsonian? My ignorance on that subject is that I never read the original display that the Air Force Association objected to back in September. So I really can't comment on the original display. But the idea that we can't tell it like it was because it offends some groups within our society is a mistake. It's just a mistake, that's all. I've heard a theory that uh, if we hadn't dropped the bomb, that eventually the Cold War would have, would have had a nuclear war with the Soviets. If both sides realized how severe this was. What do you think about that? Uh, the question is, if we had not dropped the bomb, would not the Cold War have entered in nuclear war because we wouldn't have understood how horrible a weapon it was. And um, um, my answer to that was, I can't believe we could be that ignorant of it, the effects. We fired off test shots, we did all the measurements. Uh, Oppenheimer, based on the test shots, estimates that if it's dropped on one of the live targets, it will run to about 20,000 casualties. In fact, it runs to 70,000 casualties. But that's 20,000 is pretty horrible. So I, did, I have never been able to believe that scientific testing of the weapon would not reveal its effects, and that we actually had to drop it on live humans in order to see how horrible it was.
I only listed the end games. I didn't, I didn't play with them and suggest the possibilities. Uh, furthermore, I'm not a historian. I'm a history teacher. Um, <laughs> historians are dignified, usually handsome, and extremely wise. I lose on all counts. Uh, but I do enjoy teaching history, and I have thought about the possibilities of the end game. And of course, to me, uh, the end game of negotiations, which is the normal way of ending war, with all the others contributing and, and providing a situation of stress and force on, on Japan, uh, would have been the most useful. As a matter of fact, my personal solution to the problem was instead of dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, we should have strapped. Under Secretary Joseph C. Grew in a parachute and dropped him on Hiroshima <laughs> and said, as soon as you get on the ground, start talking to those people. Um, that, that's an extreme case, and Under Secretary, <laughs> Under Secretary Grew had not signed the permit slip that allowed parachute jumping. But, if you take as the key element the negotiations, you add the island hopping of the army by bringing the army forces together, bringing the troop transports in, and threatening Japan with an invasion. You continue the bombing, shifting from cities where people live to transportation systems, and eliminate by aerial bombardment the Japanese uh, land and sea transportation system completely so they can't move anything anywhere. You tighten the blockade, put more submarines out, and tighten the blockade completely. And you hold the, a demonstration, possibly on an island in Tokyo Bay, uh, of the atomic weapon at a rush hour uh, on a summer evening in Japan. And that combination, I think, would have brought negotiations with no invasion and no further cost in American lives. One of the jokes, one of the ironies of, of the situation is, at the time, many Americans did not feel the atomic bomb was necessary. That we could have negotiated a peace settlement without invading or dropping the atomic bomb. Eisenhower, MacArthur, Marshall, the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and after the war, the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey all come to that conclusion, that neither the invasion nor the bomb was necessary. Japan was ready to surrender. So why did you drop it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um... <laughs> Again, if it's, one of the problems of the difference between a history teacher and a historian is a history teacher is obliged to answer questions. Uh, a historian can say he's going to do some research on that. I think we dropped it out of bureaucratic inertia. The armed forces are a bureaucracy. Their mission is to wage war. You give them a new weapon, and it never occurs to them to not use it. You turn the bomb over to the Air Force in the summer of 1945, and the Air Force's job is to drop bombs, not to think about it. So we had the bomb. There was never any serious discussion of not using it. And President Truman, for all his, his bravado, and I use that term because I think that's what it was, about, and I made the decision. He didn't make any decision. The decision had already been made. He simply didn't stop the decision. So all the weight was for dropping the bomb. And not the least, and I might as well go ahead and say this and completely blow whatever authority and self and respect I might have had, not the least is revenge. And when President Truman goes on the air the day after the bomb is dropped, he says, they started the war with an air raid, and we ended it with one.
Th that's a really tough question. Why does war occur and is it inevitable? It would seem, since it's a human activity, that humans could refrain from it. Uh, they don't seem to have any willingness to do so. There are people say that uh, no nation, no cause is worth dying for, and yet there are many people who feel that nations and causes are in fact worth dying for. So I would say if you were to ask me as a betting man to put money down, I would put it on war. But having said that, war with the minimum ferocity. There are agreements on the conduct of war, and those agreements are important. The treatment of civilians, the treatment of the wounded, the treatment of prisoners of war, those are conventions that should be respected. And if you don't think so, Imagine yourself lying out in a field somewhere, wounded, about to be taken prisoner. The other guy to respect those conventions would be them. With reciprocity being with what it is, then of course you have to respect them too. Other questions? Please? of events affects political decisions and that historians are helpful in, in creating the, the memory of what happened, what I talked about originally, and in that is their responsibility and their job. And yes, I think, I think they can help. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that a historian comes breaking into the Oval Office and says, say, Mr. Perez, uh, you better, not that kind of help. But by keeping the record straight, for instance, in the Enola Gay controversy, and by addressing the question, going back and finding out what happened and exposing that in a calm and reasonable way, yes, I think, I think historians can influence. I doubt that history teachers can, but historians can. The question is, is the dropping of the atomic bomb the first act of the Cold War as well as the last act of the, of the, of the Second World War? And the answer, I think, is yes. Uh, people who were in Moscow uh, in 1945-46 say that the American refusal to open the information on the atomic bomb drove the Russians right up the wall. They were terrified at what they saw and knew. Now, their own nuclear program was already underway by that time and had been since 1942 but we were way ahead of them, and they were terrified, and they were determined to enter into the Cold War with nuclear weapons. Please. Yeah. That's hard to answer. The Korsbach article, Why Men Love War, is actually based on another book we use in 366, uh, Jay Glenn Gray's book, The Warriors. And it doesn't, it doesn't, when they say why men love war, they aren't talking about why men fight war. They're talking about why after wars men look back on it and it will be women, because women were involved in the Persian Gulf War. From now on it will be men and women. We'll look back on it with a certain fondness. And the statement, the cliche that's made over and over again by veterans, I wouldn't give a million dollars to do it again, but I wouldn't give a million dollars for the experience. I wouldn't take a million dollars to do it again. I wouldn't give a million uh, dollars for the experience. <laughs> you know, you can't really rely on those veterans. <laughs> But the question as, as to my own uh, involvement, uh, I don't feel my involvement was emotional, very emotional. I was older. I had been in the Army for 10 years before I went to Vietnam. I didn't have any searing emotional experiences. But the idea of the, of the comradeship 
working together under severe stress and danger, uh, that is something that you look back on with a certain fondness and you don't find it in the average faculty department. <laughs> I, I don't mean that in any, any slurring way or slighting way, but it's just different. And it's something that you do look back on fondly, I think. Thank you, Mario. Let me let that be the last question, if I could, because I don't know the answer to it. Uh, the, the idea of the information revolution harnessed to war is raising possibilities that are being studied right now very seriously in the armed forces. And I am not there and don't see those studies going on. All I know is that they do exist. And I think you're quite right. You put your finger on it. Wars are going to be very, very different and fighting over the access and the interchange of information is going to be critical. And let me finish by saying that's much of what the U.S. Air Force was trying to do to Saddam Hussein. Blind him, take away his ears and his ability to speak by uh, cutting the communication system that linked the armies together. And I think that's going to become increasingly important. Let me end by saying again, as I said before, I can't express, I just can't express how pleased I am to know that the students who I think so much of would say thank you to me.